This photo was taken in the early 1900s. It's of two twins, one vaccinated against smallpox and the other not. For some, this photo offers a sobering reminder of a precarious time before we all knew the protections that vaccines have offered modern man. The stark reality of combating a highly infectious disease without a vaccine has revisited man with the arrival of COVID-19. This is a virus for which there had been no vaccine and no antiviral. We're still learning a lot about the virus, understanding its transmission, understanding its epidemiology, understanding how severe it is, who has risk factors for severe disease, who has risk factors for mild disease, and many other questions that still haven't been answered even uh, several months into this pandemic. As the world scrambled to manage the outbreak, the question many have been asking is, when will a vaccine be ready? Donald Trump, himself once a critic of vaccine standards, met with leading US pharmaceutical companies as part of his early response to see what could be done to fast-track the development of a vaccine for coronavirus. In the meeting, he floated the idea of getting a vaccine to the public by November 2020, eight months from the meeting. Experts in the room were quick to correct expectations. That timeline was simply unrealistic. But the urgency Donald Trump expressed certainly wasn't. Vaccines in their development aren't usually measured in months, they're usually measured in years, and sometimes it's been decades before we have a vaccine candidate. So this is something that we have to be prepared to wait for. The average reproduction rate, the R0, of coronavirus is between 1.4 and 2.5, meaning that with each infection a further 2.5 people will be infected. The initial global infection rate saw the virus doubling in populations roughly every six days in early 2020. In response, most governments have sought to slow the transmission of the virus through social distancing and quarantines to flatten the curve. The types of control measures that are needed are going to vary from country to country, and I think ideally they should be based on a couple of things. One is, what's the local spread of the infection in your area? How, how high is the intensity of spread? We need to make sure that the hospitals aren't stretched beyond their limit, but we need to keep the economy going. To me, the job of government is to get that thing right. Mm. And it's a compromise, and you need to have the courage, okay, to go for what's right for society in the long term. There is the prospect that we're going to have to have modifications in our behaviors for some time until there's a vaccine. If we can add capacity, the way they're doing in New York City, for example, with building field hospitals and bringing military hospital ships into the port, get testing in place, then we can start to think about how can we go about life safely. The aim is to limit the spread of the infection through the population at a rate that the healthcare system could manage whilst upscaling operations, gradually allowing for some immunity to develop in the community from those who've been ill and have recovered, and finally, to save lives and fight for time to acquire new technologies and cures, including antivirals and that holy grail of defence, a new vaccine. It's not clear that a vaccine can be developed. Hopefully it can be. There are about 30, 35 candidate vaccines. Some have been immediately put into humans. Others are going through a more traditional route of development, which includes studies in an animal model, and that model is the macaque monkey. If they're shown to be safe and effective in a monkey, then they go on to studies in humans. And if they're shown to be safe and effective in humans, they can be eventually licensed. The same basic principle is in operation for all vaccines. A pathogen, or part of it, is introduced to the human immune system at a low dose. This prompts our system to produce antibodies. Our system maintains a memory for these antibodies, which are mobilised again once exposed to the virus in its natural form. Edward Jenner is considered the founder of vaccinology. He inoculated a 13-year-old boy with cowpox in 1796 and was able to demonstrate an immunity to smallpox. Many diseases that roam the earth are, are not even problems anymore. We've actually eradicated a virus off of the planet, smallpox, with the power of a vaccine. As incremental advancements in the technology were developed, by the mid-1980s, vaccines for polio, measles, mumps and rubella had played a vital role in the battle against these diseases. Vaccines are probably the greatest human achievement that's ever occurred. If you look at what, what vaccines have done, they've really literally added decades to people's lifespans. This is a technological marvel and uh, really should be uh, praised in the same way that we praise any other type of technology, but even, even more so. People should be lining up 
to get the new vaccines the way they line up outside of an Apple store. Molecular genetics has offered us a new future with vaccinology. Recent years have seen the development of new delivery systems such as DNA and plant vaccines, and further advancements have been made for pandemic influenza, HIV and herpes, among others. The World Health Organization announced that a viable vaccine, which has passed the process of human trials and regulatory procedures, would, optimistically, only be available in 18 months. This is an infectious disease for which the whole world is at risk. So this isn't something that's a niche vaccine. You have to have manufacturing capacity, most likely even bigger than what you do for seasonal influenza because of the demand for this vaccine. And that's why we're, we're sticking to this 12 to 18 month timeline if everything goes well. Manufacturers have to plan six months in advance if they are going to get that vaccine uh, and they roll it out quickly. And the big problem is, is is they don't know what vaccine they're likely to end up with. And therefore, it's quite difficult to set things up properly. For Britain, that could be a problem because we don't have much, if any, manufacturing capability. So we've got some of the best labs in the world, and the best scientists in the world, but we don't have great capability in terms of our manufacture. Donald Trump may have been overly optimistic in his initial hopes for a rapid vaccine, but there has been a head start. SARS-CoV-2, the virus behind COVID-19, shares between 80 and 90% of its genetic makeup with the virus that causes SARS. Both have an RNA strip housed in a protein capsule which is covered in spikes. These spikes attach to receptors in cells within the human lung. The virus then breaks into the cell and hijacks the cell's reproductive mechanisms to develop copies of itself before breaking out again, killing the cell in the process. In early January of 2020, China shared the sequencing of the genetic material for SARS-CoV-2. During both the SARS outbreak in China in the early 2000s and the MERS outbreak in the Middle East in 2014, development had been made on vaccines. As both outbreaks were coronaviruses sharing the same genetic makeup, the vaccine projects are being repurposed for COVID-19. Around 35 institutions have entered the race using multiple technologies, Traditionally, immunization has been achieved with live, weakened forms of the virus that have been inactivated. Newer technologies include using genetic code to build a copy of the virus's protein case around bacteria or yeast, or even more advanced, to build the vaccines from the virus's genetic instruction, the RNA. These vaccines range from using messenger RNA to using virus-like particles that look like the virus, to actually using the whole virus or parts of that virus um, hooked onto other types of vaccine backbones. So there's a whole series of different vaccines which are being studied. Given the different advantageous head starts, some institutions have already announced the early start of human trials, including that of a British vaccine from researchers at Oxford University, who set goals to commence human trials in April 2020, and were looking at means to improve timelines. Building a vaccine can be done in weeks, but there are many barriers before a viable vaccine reaches the public. We need to test this in a large number of people to know does it work and how safe is it? How durable is it? What is the dose of the vaccine you have to give a person? Typically, there are three phases to clinical human trials. The first phase, a small group of healthy individuals are utilized to test for safety and adverse effects. In the second, a few hundred individuals in an area affected by the disease are monitored for efficacy. And the final phase, a few thousand individuals, again, looking at efficacy. Remember, you're giving a vaccine to a healthy population and you're gonna be giving it to maybe a, you know, billions of people potentially. So whatever might be a small side effect that maybe happens in 0.01, that's a lot, large number of people. So you have to really have an idea of what the risk benefit ratio is for each individual. There has to be big enough trials to pick up these side effects that might be very low in frequency, but if you vaccinate the world, may end up being a problem. There are many vaccines that start the process looking very strong that don't complete trials. The fall off rate for failed candidates is sharp. For that reason, the process can take over a decade and carries a high degree of fiscal risk. If the product is similar to one previously approved, such as the yearly influenza shot, then the regulatory process can be expedited. 
But SARS-CoV-2 is a new and unique pathogen within humans, and many of the vaccine technologies being trialled are also novel. The COVID-19 vaccine candidates will be required to undergo stringent trialling to meet regulatory standards. Some institutions hope to run parts of the trialling process in tandem to speed up the process. Following the regulatory process, manufacture would have to be brought to scale for distribution across the globe. Funding production facilities to meet demand would run into the billions and construction would have to commence prior to the completion of trials. The final barrier before a vaccine boosts the global herd immunity is that of distribution to those who need it. Global politics, economics and varying standards may well prove to be the most seismic barrier. Equitable global distribution is critical because if countries can agree to share the vaccine and get it to high-risk groups such as health workers first, then the rollout of the vaccine will be orderly uh, and we can be reasonably sure it will be fair and equitable. If they don't cooperate on that, uh, it's a sort of every man for himself sort of scenario and there will be winners and there will be losers. And it's very, very difficult to say right now who they would be. Already, there have been indications that the US is interested in acquiring a vaccine solution to meet the needs of the US population first. As the pressures from COVID-19 escalate within individual nations, so too will the political pressure to respond accordingly. Presuming the WHO, who coordinates the global response, were able to secure a global distribution of the new vaccine, even countries with the best developed guidelines face challenges, from who should receive care first, from healthcare practitioners to pregnant women, through to how to manage the impact of outside challenges, such as the anti-vax movement on a region, leaving questions to how global distributions would be impacted by regional logistical challenges. The emergence of a pandemic is perhaps the most pertinent reminder of our global interconnection. What you're looking for is orderly international cooperation so that your vaccine strategy has most impact. And if you don't get that, your vaccine strategy won't have most impact and that will lead to the nullification of the strategy altogether. The thing that troubled me early in the, in the epidemic was the focus on shutting down borders. Um, as opposed to coming together to, to find a solution, to help out the Chinese, to have that kind of collaboration, which I think was happening on the level of the scientific community. But politically, the response was, let's just try to keep everyone out. Even the most stringent national lockdowns and national responses will inevitably leave one vulnerable to outside viral and reinfection threats. Laurie Garrett, the Pulitzer Prize winner, wrote, Without equity, pandemic battles will fail. Viruses will simply recirculate and perhaps undergo mutations or changes that render vaccines useless, passing through the unprotected populations of the planet. We need to learn that this is a globalized world and it's a world where an event in one country is important for all other countries. The virus continues to circulate in countries that haven't had the opportunity to contain it because of a lack of experience or equipment or supplies, then these countries will continue to be at risk of importations and an increase in transmission. We need to make sure that we're all working together and not individually as countries, which is very difficult to convince countries to do. As COVID-19 questions on the practices of wet markets in China or the planning for a vaccine come to the fore, the answers to each will have global consequences. I do think that people have to get smart with the way that they're handling animals. It doesn't mean that you have to not or ban the, not do this or ban these things, but they have to be done with some level of biosafety. We've learnt that how a person in Wuhan, China, chooses to slaughter and consume animal produce could result a few months later in a life and death situation for Italians in Bergamo. So too, choices and solutions made by our leaders in the urgent quest for a vaccine will determine our collective success, should one be found. Viruses like this one don't respect borders and it needs to be fought on a united front. And if we're going to combat it, we need to come together as a world and fight it as one.